Oakland Technical High School has stood sentinel on Broadway in Oakland, California since 1915, but its reach extends far beyond the three square blocks it occupies. As the school marks its centennial in the 2014-15 school year, it rightfully celebrates the proud place it holds in Oakland's history and the many contributions its alumni have made, both locally and well beyond Oakland's borders. One hundred years is a long life for an American high school, especially one on the West Coast. In the case of Oakland Technical High School, known over the years as Technical, Tech High, and Oakland Tech, one hundred years is long enough to have received, molded, educated, and graduated an inordinate number of students who went on to become judges, politicians, actors, entertainers, professional athletes, academics, scientists, mathematicians, business leaders, social activists, dancers, artists, and educators. A brief list of Oakland Tech graduates who have gone on to achieve national or international notoriety include Tony Martin, actor and singer, class of 1930, Frank Oz, co-creator of The Muppets, 1962, the Pointer Sisters, soul and rock singers, the 1960s, Clint Eastwood, actor and director, class of 1948, Ricky Henderson, Baseball Hall of Fame, 1976, Rod McEwen, songwriter, poet, 1951, Patricia Palatko, author of over 50 children's books, 1962, Marshawn Lynch, football player for the Seattle Seahawks, 2003, Robert Weber, actor, 1941, Ted Lange, actor, director, screenwriter, 1966, Stephen Bechtel Sr., head of the Bechtel Corporation, 1918. Ron Dellums, mayor of Oakland and U.S. Congressman, 1953. Goro Suzuki, also known as Jack Sue, actor, 1934. Huey Newton, co-founder of the Black Panther Party, 1959. But countless other Oakland Tech graduates have played equally significant roles in events that have shaped the city of Oakland, the state of California, and the nation. In fact, it is difficult to imagine an American high school that has produced and contributed more graduates directly in the tremendous social, cultural, and political changes that this country has seen over the last 100 years. Many of Oakland Tech's first students were the children of San Franciscans who relocated to Oakland after the earthquake of 1906. Others were working-class Italian-Americans whose parents and grandparents quarried the stones used to build the East Bay. Oakland Tech trained soldiers for both world wars right on the campus, sent them overseas, and supported the war efforts in many ways. During World War II, the school welcomed African-American students whose parents migrated from the South, seeking employment in the shipyards, military bases, and railroads of Oakland. At the same time, Oakland Tech lost its Japanese-American students to forced internment in relocation camps. In the 1960s, Oakland Tech students were at the forefront of social change by founding the first high school black student union in the country and joined the ranks of the newly formed Black Panther Party. Despite graduating truly exceptional students, the combination of urban decay, white flight, and the destructive effects that California Proposition 13 had on educational funding resulted in Oakland Tech's transformation from a well-resourced school to an underfunded school from the 1970s through to the early 2000s. But even throughout those lean years, many dedicated Tech students and teachers remained at Tech and clung to their high ideals. The 1980s witnessed the birth of innovative new academic programs at Tech, and a group of Tech students and their teacher, who called themselves the Apollos, successfully lobbied Sacramento to declare Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday a state holiday. 
Now, with a current enrollment exceeding 2,000 students, Tech is thriving with a diverse student body which mirrors that of Oakland. Challenging academics, several career academies, and a variety of sports, arts, and club activities. The overwhelming majority of its graduates go on to college. Honoring its roots in Oakland. Its main building, a grand and inspiring edifice, has remained the same since 1915. Tech's magnificent 800-foot-long facade with its sweeping front steps and soaring columns has been lovingly depicted in school yearbooks, newspapers, and other publications and has been the subject of numerous photographers over the years. The main building, which attained official landmark status in 1985, was designed by the same architect who designed Oakland City Hall, J.J. Donovan. Donovan had a passion for grand public architecture and believed the school's facade should reflect the lofty work going on within its walls. Architecturally, ahead of his time, Donovan was a proponent of the use of natural light and native plants. The main building contained a commercial wing for bookkeeping and stenography, an academic study wing, a home economics area, and drafting rooms for mechanical, architectural, and freehand drawing. Separate buildings housed eight shops, machine, forge, foundry, electrical, carpentry, plumbing, and metalworking. Technical's founding principal, P.M. Fisher, who served the school for 28 years, was also ahead of his time in espousing the value and dignity of both vocational and academic education and in forging strong school community bonds. We are always in these days endeavoring to separate intellect and manual labor. We want one man to be thinking and another to always be working. And we call one a gentleman and the other an operator. Whereas the workman ought to be thinking and the thinker to be working. And both should be called a gentleman in the best sense. Technical High School opened its massive bronze doors on January 4th, 1915 to 76 teachers and 1,450 students. World War I was already raging in Europe, but there was a feeling of optimism and hope at the school. The citizens of Oakland had spent nearly $700,000, over $16 million in today's dollars, for a new school to replace Oakland Technical High School's predecessor, the Manual Training and Commercial High School on 12th and Market Streets. Rightfully proud of their new school, the community turned out en masse for the official dedication in February of 1915. The gleaming two-tiered auditorium was packed for the ceremony. The variety of classes offered in Technical's early school was extraordinary. In addition to science, mathematics, foreign languages, English, and histories, Courses were offered in mechanical drawing, woodworking and carpentry, advertising and salesmanship, botany, social problems. The extracurricular offerings were equally broad and included girls archery, girls rowing, a ukulele club, girls field hockey, baseball, a bicycle club, a radio club, and orchestra. And a student newspaper, The Scribe News, which is still being produced today, in 1919, a scribe reporter secured interviews with the king and queen of Belgium on their visit to San Francisco and with future U.S. President Herbert Hoover. Accomplished Oakland technical students from this decade include Antonia Brico, one of the first female symphonic conductors in the world, Milman Perry, the 20th century foremost scholar of Homer, whose archive is housed at Harvard University. Louise Jorgensen, the force behind Oakland's Christmas pageant, which from 1919 to 1987 showcased 1,500 Oakland school children annually. Gabrielle Ticolat, a post-World War II envoy to the Soviet Union who worked under President Roosevelt and was honored for his service by President Johnson. Stephen Bechtel Sr., the president of one of the largest multinational corporations in the world, the Bechtel Engineering Firm. 
The amazing talent at Oakland Tech throughout its early years was nurtured by equally amazing teachers. One outstanding musician and teacher, Herman Trutner, created and directed Technical's internationally recognized music program. He taught students to play multiple instruments, including Oakland Tech's four pianos, offered classes in conducting, and he oversaw the school orchestra, chamber music ensemble, and string quartet. As the teens closed, America entered World War I, and Oakland Tech felt the war's impact. The Scribe News reported that students in the mechanical drawing classes were making drawings for Oakland's shipyards. The Oakland School Board made military education compulsory for all boys over the age of 17. This education included attacks on dummies, battalion drills, and hikes. 125 drafted men were housed on campus, and a trench was dug behind the athletic fields for training in trench warfare. Lawrence Miller, a tech knight who had been gassed at Verdun, survived, returned to technical, and wrote about his ordeal in the 1919 yearbook. I didn't notice when we rode into a pocket of gas. It was too late when we did hit it for me to get off the gloves and get the gas mask out. By the time I got around to where I could put it on, we were out of it, but I had already had enough to knock me out. I started to vomit almost immediately. Lawrence Miller, class of 1919. A war display in the lobby listed over 150 students and teachers who were serving overseas. Not all survived. The bronze plaque designed by Technical's first art teacher, Goddard Gale, and paid for with $600 raised by Oakland Tech students and teachers, remains to this day in the school's front lobby, honoring the 11 Oakland Tech boys who made the supreme sacrifice in the Great War. The plaque was unveiled in 1921 by two of the deceased men's small children. The end of the war ushered in the growth of prosperity of the 1920s. Oakland was booming with shipbuilding and so much automobile manufacturing that it became known as the Detroit of the West. Boys graduating from Oakland Tech with trade skills were assured of employment in Oakland. In the 1920s, Airplanes and air travel were capturing the country's attention. Charles Lindbergh came to Oakland to dedicate his new airport in 1927, and a girls' model airplane club was started at Tech High. Oakland Technical was growing. In addition to its 1,800 day students and 100 teachers, 3,000 additional students were enrolled in afternoon and evening classes. Technical had the second largest parent-teacher association of any school in the country with 560 parent members. A 1923 bond issued financed the purchase of five additional acres, bringing the total for the campus to 18, as well as the construction of a new gymnasium. The school auditorium was finished and dedicated this same year. Athletics were extremely popular at Technical, with many girls joining after-school sports clubs. Boys' athletics flourished as well, as Technical's teams won city championships in multiple sports, and graduates from the baseball team quickly made their way into baseball's minor and major leagues. In 1922, Oakland Tech switched from rugby to American football. Oakland Tech's boys filled the rosters of swimming, basketball, baseball, soccer, track and field, and tennis teams, and in 1926, the boys' gymnastic team was added. The opulence of the age was reflected in fairly extravagant musical and dramatic performances at Oakland Technical High School. 
Drama productions were enhanced with professional-looking sets and experimental lighting. Technical's first-ever minstrel show was performed to a packed auditorium, and 60 students performed in the opera The Pirates of Penzance, accompanied by a student orchestra of 25. Initiatives at Tech reflected the city and the nation's good fortune and optimism of the era. Scribe News reported in 1920 that the Tech Improvement Committee had undertaken a project to adorn the campus with trees, shrubbery, and ivy to last for years to come. The school embarked on a campaign to beautify the hallways as well, with money spent on original works of art. In addition to paintings by Goddard Gale, an internationally acclaimed artist who taught at Tech for three decades, and commissions for reproductions of classic paintings by a noted Tech graduate working in New York City, the school commissioned the artist Maynard Dixon to paint an allegorical mural in the auditorium depicting the history of California. This mural, which mysteriously disappeared in the 1950s, would be worth millions of dollars today. Talcott Williamson taught English at Technical from the teens until 1950. He was one of those teachers who truly cared about his students and made a lifelong impression. Tully taught a class called Senior Problems, which he refused to have limited to college prep kids. He taught all of us how to think. Imagine that. John Cooper, class of 1948. Mr. Williamson's goal was to keep at-risk boys in school to graduate. Years later, when I would read in the paper about a local award given, many recipients, when asked, what inspired you, responded with, well, I was one of Mr. Williamson's boys. Anne Phillips Cooper, class of 1948. One of the school's more successful graduates from the 1920s came back to visit the school 35 years later. After graduating in 1926, Leonidas Coates attended the Naval Academy and received his Master's of Science Engineering from Caltech. In 1956, he was promoted to Rear Admiral of the United States Navy, and he served as Chief of Naval Research from 1961 until 64. During his 1962 visit to his old school, he told the Scribe News reporters the last time I walked through this door, it wasn't reported in Scribe News. Despite its dramatic impact on the rest of the country, the only hint at Oakland Tech of the stock market crash that precipitated the Great Depression was the opening in 1929 of a savings bank on campus, a branch of the Farmers and Merchants Savings Bank, to encourage financial thrift and responsibility. In the history books, the 1930s are defined by the Depression and its accompanying hardship. But at Oakland Technical High School, the teachers and the staff gave their students order, stability, and a wide range of activities. Despite a drop in enrollment due to the family seeking employment elsewhere, tech itself didn't seem to suffer from the Depression. An elaborate structure for student leadership had developed with 10 students serving on the school's executive board, most overseeing large committees and an additional eight students serving on the dean's advisory committee. There were two honor societies, the California Scholarship Federation and the Gold T, and three student publications, the Tecolate, a literary magazine, Senior Memories, the yearbook, and the Scribe News, the student newspaper. Students were active in over 50 different clubs, and Tech Nights filled the ranks of four school choral groups, the Boys Glee Club, the Girls Glee Club, the Senior Chorus, and an a cappella group. The main building and the shop buildings each had their own student traffic boards to keep passing time orderly. Students flourished under the guidance of coaches who pushed their students hard on athletic fields that were still primarily dirt. Girls danced, played field hockey, developed skills with a bow and arrow, golfed, 
and generally had fun in physical education classes. The school's graduation took place on the front lawn. In the 1930s, many graduates left the depression behind them to launch very successful careers and live long and productive lives. Until her death in February of 2015, Esther McFeely, class of 1930, was likely Tech's oldest living graduate. She lived in the same house in Rockridge from 1920 until her death. In school, she sang in the girls' glee club. She later married her high school sweetheart, also a Tech Knight graduate, and raised a family. Mrs. McFeely mentioned that the shorthand and sewing skills that she learned in high school served her professionally throughout her life. Incredibly, Maybell Craig Broussard, who is 100 years old, attended the Oakland Technical High School Centennial Book Launch in October of 2014. Her father was born into slavery at the tail end of the Civil War, and her mother set high academic standards for her. Mrs. Broussard has fond memories of her years in high school. There weren't many black students at Technical when I was there. Some of my friends there were Japanese, and we were close friends, but I lost track of them after high school. I remember Niels Johnson, who taught Spanish. He had a lot of influence on me and my majoring in Spanish in college. I remember I had a good algebra teacher. I was never good at math before that. I took all college prep classes, no business classes, but I did go to business college at Merritt for a semester after high school. There I took typing. My mother made me go to college, so I went to Cal. Maybell Craig Broussard, class of 1931. In the years Mrs. Broussard was at Cal, 10% of Americans attended college, but the percentage of African-American women attending college at that time was a tiny fraction of that. Finding a job after graduating from Cal was difficult. She married, raised a family, and in the 1960s worked as a bilingual employment counselor and ESL teacher. When he was a young child, Lloyd Ferguson conducted chemistry experiments in his backyard. By the time he started high school in 1931, he had already developed a number of household products including a moth repellent and a spot remover. At Tech, Edward Long, the head of the chemistry department, recognized Ferguson's aptitude and encouraged him to go to college. In 1934, at the age of 16, Lloyd Ferguson graduated from school. Four years later, he graduated with honors in chemistry from UC Berkeley, and in 1943, he became the first African American to receive a Ph.D. in chemistry from Cal. When no major chemical company would hire him because of his race, he pursued a career in academia. He eventually became the chair of the chemistry department at Howard University and went on to teach at Cal State L.A., where a lecture series, scholarship, and courtyard are named in his honor. Leslie Smith graduated from high school in 1937 and from Cal four years later. After graduating dental school in San Francisco, Dr. Smith taught at UC Berkeley School of Dentistry for 35 years and had his own practice. He has fond memories of his time at Oakland Technical High School, and he still gets together with fellow Tech Knights. Tech was a good school, one of the best around at that time. Wonderful teachers, great people. I remember many of my teachers. I remember Mrs. Bjornsson well. She was very, very interested in politics and was a strong advocate for FDR. She talked a lot about him and his policies. We all felt at the time that he was doing a good job. She made us feel more connected with him and his policies. It wasn't traditional then in classes to talk about the real world. I liked her very much. She used to talk with me as an individual after class, too. Leslie Smith, class of 1937. The students who graduated from Oakland Tech in the 1930s had no idea how much their lives and the life of their country 
would change in the following decade. Though World War II was already raging overseas, tech was still enjoying peace and prosperity in the early 1940s. In the morning, <laughs> I wore curler curlers all night, and there's always fog. And so I'd put my scarf on and went to school and got there early, so like 7 o'clock or so, so I could take my hair down and then walk up and down the hallways to see who was going with who and what was going on and all that stuff. Actually, also I remember there was a place across the street called the Bulldog uh, where everybody went to have, um, you know, not coffee, but uh, Cokes and stuff like that. That sticks in my memory because it seems like there was a group of us who used to end up there every day after school. Uh -huh. uh, when Japan bombed Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, Life changed for all of America, and the halls of Oakland Tech were no exception. In February 1942, President Roosevelt signed the Executive Order 9066, which declared that all Americans of Japanese descent on the Pacific Coast be interred in camps. Frequently, families only had hours to gather their belongings and evacuate their homes. People had scrawled on the sidewalk, go home, Japs. We cried. We lost all of our Japanese friends. From one day to the next, they were gone, and they never came back after the evacuation. Ruth Beckford, class of 1943. Another student, William Forrester, class of 1948, recalled the return of Japanese students after the war. The names were clearly Japanese. These students had lately returned to their home turf after release from the war relocation camps. Yet I failed to notice their return, not to mention their departure back in 42. After the abuse of their rights of citizenship for four years, these latecomers should have been warmly recognized, welcomed, and invited into the school's circle of friendship. But in fact, they were never mentioned. To my enduring shame, I failed to observe their presence. I failed to acknowledge them with the friendly word. William Forrester, class of 1948. I remember one particular girl that used to sit out, and we were talking to her quite a bit. And all of a sudden, she was gone. And we, we knew, you know, what had happened, and we just kind of, we didn't. There wasn't anything to do. Mr. Welty, the principal, however, had not forgotten his Japanese students. On June 14, 1942, Oakland Tech had its official graduation. After the ceremony, Miss Wilder collected the flowers from the stage. The next day, Mr. Welty and four teachers traveled to the Tan Foran Assembly Center. They conducted a graduation ceremony for the Tech Knights who would have graduated the night before but for their confinement. Mr. Welty commented in the Scribe News, We tried to perform that graduation just as the previous ceremony took place at Technical. In addition to conducting graduation, they bought report cards to all the students. One student, Roy Suyamoto, was already serving in the military when Executive Order 9066 was signed. He was the class valedictorian in 1940. He returned home on furlough in February 1942. He found that his family had already been relocated. He went to the Oakland police station for help in finding his family. Mr. Suyamoto was not reunited with his family, but placed under military escort and was transported immediately back to his duty station. His ordeal was reported in the Oakland Tribune. Terry Tabata, class of 1941, was the first Japanese-American tech knight known to be killed in the war. Mr. Welty was quoted in Scribe News as saying, "...a hundred percent American in thought and deed," when he was informed of Tabata's death. Tabata's own parents learned that their son had been killed somewhere in France while interned in Topaz, Utah.
Alumni did what they could to support the war effort. Tech students purchased war bonds, raised $175,000 to purchase a bomber, and sent letters to their fellow tech knights who were serving overseas. Eleanor Tomsevic Parker, class of 44, recalled conservation efforts. Because resources were scarce, I did not receive my silver pin for my athletic achievements, and our senior memories book was only one-eighth of an inch thick. Eleanor Tomsevic Parker, class of 1944. Pearl Habermel McCarthy, class of 47, remembered that sugar and shoes were rationed. She dated a boy who gave her an extra coupon for shoes, and she was thrilled with the gift. Many students remember working to pick up the slack from all the adults who had to leave jobs to fight overseas. Marv Tripp, class of 43, remembers working as a dishwasher, at a rug company, and as a caddy. He also remembers studying hard in high school because he knew he would be drafted and he wanted to be admitted to an officer's training program. Doris Hickenbottom Mullen, class of 43, remembered working and attending school on the 4-4 plan. She attended school and returned home at 3.30. She then walked to Pacific Telegraph, where she worked from 5 until 9. She felt very strongly that she was doing her part for the war. Pearl Habermill McCarthy also recalled that Sears was open Thursday evenings and Saturday during the day. Girls were paid 50 cents an hour, and boys were paid 75 cents an hour for the same work. Maurice Engel, class of 45, remembered working for Southern Pacific Railroad. Southern Pacific hired us kids for 50 cents an hour on Saturdays and 75 cents an hour on Sundays to lay track and clean up. I remember the troop trains passing through, and once one of them pulled up to the Oakland Mole as I was trying to hit a spike. I kept missing, and when I finally hit it, they cheered. I was so embarrassed. Maurice Engel, class of 1945. Stuart McCormick, class of 48, recalled, School assemblies would be used to recruit students for the military. So many people were killed during the war years because just about everyone went into the service. Some students were drafted before they graduated. One student drafted before graduation was Dan Costello, class of 1944. In September of 1943, he received his draft notice, and nine months later he, he returned in uniform for his June 1944 commencement ceremony. And of course, assistant principal Doc Hess was famous. Everyone loved him. He corresponded with tech kids overseas in the service. They would buy little bulldogs wherever they were and send them to Doc. He had a little collection of them in his office. He knew where we all were overseas. Those were good years. Stuart McCormick, class of 1948. Tech Knights distinguished themselves in service to their country. Paul Durkell class of 36, was awarded five bronze stars. When he died at the age of 96 in 2013, his heroics were described in his online obituary. Starting in March 1943, he served in the Army Air Corps. During his 24th mission in March 1945, Lieutenant Durko, navigating for the entire squadron, was in position in the nose of the B-24 Liberator when the aircraft sustained heavy enemy fire and went down. Reaching for his parachute and finding it gone, Lieutenant Durkle crawled through the burning and fast-dropping plane to find the last parachute, only to discover that it had been damaged by fire. Miraculously, the parachute functioned, and after diving from the plane, Lieutenant Durkle and the surviving members were captured by local villagers who immediately hanged several of the airmen. A pair of German soldiers on patrol arriving on the scene and ironically prevented the villagers from hanging Lieutenant Durkle. Roger Romaine, class of 38, was one of the first black officers to be commissioned from the Bay Area. He was assigned as a fighter pilot to the all-black Mustang Fighting Group, also known as the Tuskegee Airmen. He was credited with shooting down three enemy planes. On the day he downed two of those planes, 
He wrote a letter home, which later appeared in Oakland Tribune. We are all afraid, but chance decides in most cases. Flame and fear and chance then can make a man a hero or a fool. He was 24 years old when he perished in Italy. Maurice Engel, editor of Scribe News, wrote after President Franklin Roosevelt died, It is up to us to hold high the torch of liberty, decency, and democracy. As life returned to normal after the war, the images that seemed emblematic of the age reflected optimism and the carefree teenager. While there are plenty of images to support the wistful notion of the frivolous, carefree teenager, the students who walked the halls of tech during the 1950s were also shaped by the experiences of World War II. The tech nights of the 1950s carried the ideals of loyalty, friendship, decency, and democracy with them. These ideals were born out in 60-plus-year friendships, 50-year marriages, and a commitment to excellence at school, both while they were students and as alumni. Double dating, dancing the jitterbug, and before going out on a date, tucking 10 cents in their penny loafers to call home if necessary, forged a friendship between Jeanette Brock, class of 1950, and Julie Famey that has spanned over 60 years. They both married local men. Jeanette's husband was a 1947 Tech graduate, raised their families together, and shared life's joys and sorrows. Donna Kangas Smith, class of 1952, was head cheerleader and president of her junior class. The atmosphere at Tech when I was there was very happy. People of all races got along. We used to gather on the front lawn and big groups would sit together eating lunch and enjoying friendships. I actually met my husband who was in the class of 1950 at Tech. We've been married since 1955 and have had many interesting travels and experiences in our life together. Donna Kanga Smith, class of 1952. Other couples who met at Tech and married are Sharon O'Neill Wirtz, 1958, Michael Wirtz, 1958, Shardell Doza, class of 59, and Aldo Doza, class of 55. Among other things, Rod Stollery, class of 1954, was sports editor of The Scribe, Bobo the Bulldog, and a member of the Block T Society. Our class was extremely active and was responsible for starting the Oakland Tech Library Fund. I was proud to have been involved in the early days of this alumni group. We were able to rebuild the school library following a devastating earthquake and provide scholarship funds for deserving students. To this day, I still keep in contact with a number of classmates on a regular basis. The principal told us during orientation, Tech is a melting pot with a mix of Caucasian, Black, Oriental, and Hispanic students. And nowhere on the campus was this more evident than in school sports. I was the student manager of our championship football team, and we had players such as John Brody, Charlie Hardy, Proverb Jacobs, Purvis Atkins, and Ray Norton. Rod Stollery, class of 1954. Tech was not only strong in football, but baseball and basketball. Joe Gaines, class of 55, remembered playing for legendary coach Al Kite. He was pretty strict. He made us all go to class, and the teachers made sure you stayed on track. Al Kite coached at Tech from 1926 to 1966. During that time, he won 22 Oakland Athletic League titles in basketball and 10 in baseball. He coached numerous professional athletes. At Tech in the 1950s, opportunities in the arts abounded. 
One of my fondest memories of Tech is being a member of the swing band, playing for assemblies and other outside performances. However, this experience was even more meaningful because I shared it with two of my lifelong friends, Clarence Walker, who played piano and bass, and William Bubba Bill, baritone sax. Ernest Gregor, class of 1953. A notable graduate of this decade is Bernice Bing. After graduating from Tech in 1955, she earned a BFA and an MFA from the San Francisco Art Institute. She became an award-winning artist of the Beat Era. Oakland Tech stayed true to Principal Fisher's wish of according dignity to all endeavors that offered students a chance to be challenged, and students were certainly challenged in college prep classes and shop classes. Many things have changed, of course. Behind me, there's a building that says Oakland Tech Building. That used to be the armory. And uh, around that area, we, there were uh, kids could become mechanics. Uh, it was good for the teachers because the teachers would just drop their cars off and the students would fix them and learn at the same time. And there was the aircraft engine, the radial engine class over there also. If I remember correctly, the, uh, the engine was taken apart and then the next class had to put it together again. And at the end of the year, they pushed the button and started it. And you could hear that engine all over North Oakland. Many alumni from the 1950s fondly remembered all the dances Tech held. From September of 1950 to January of 1951, there were seven dances and each one had a theme. This uh, girl turns out to be my sister-in-law later on in life, but she was dating a white kid. And I don't think, even think they were dating. I, don't, I, I didn't know her that well then, but anyway, he asked her to the senior ball, and that was a no-no. I almost had this woman's name, the vice principal. Uh, so everybody talked about that. They could not come. He could not bring her to the senior ball. It just wasn't happening right. in those days. Right. And, and so the kid probably didn't think any, you know, there was going to be an issue about it. He was popular too, I think he was in the band. Really nice kid, and she certainly was a nice girl. And, and he asked her to the senior ball, and his vice principal said, no, it's not happening here. Yeah, I remember that, that was not too cool. Three years of interaction with students and faculty began my ability to form my own thinking processes for a lifetime of learning life lessons. Being a bulldog carried pride throughout the school years, and 58 years later, still conjures up pride. Gerald Foreman, class of 1955. The 1960s was a fascinating decade at Oakland Tech. In some ways, the decade seemed split in two. Images from the early 1960s are reminiscent of those of the 50s. Bill Du Bois, class of 60, fondly recalls doing the electric slide at junior and senior proms. Dixie Jordan, class of 60, recalls going to the drive-in on Telegraph Avenue for hamburgers and cruising cars on Friday and Saturday nights. The Tech Choir of 1960 had the privilege of attending and performing at the opening ceremonies for the 1960 Olympics held at Squaw Valley. Throughout the 1960s, race was on the minds of Tech students, and there were as many different experiences of the impact of race as there were students. One of the most touching accounts was Andrew Mitchell's Class of 65 recollection of a couple dancing at a school assembly. The school's drama department would normally perform a skit or something at the start of an assembly. The curtain opened after it got about as quiet as it was going to get, Nothing was on the stage as two people approached each other from the opposite sides. One was a black student named James Barber. He was short, and everybody nicknamed him Tiny. From the other side came a white girl whose name I can't remember. She was a couple inches taller than Tiny and was incredibly good-looking. As they walked toward each other, 
the audience became really quiet. They put out their arms like they were going to shake hands, and as soon as their fingers met, the song Do You Love Me by The Contours blared from the speakers. From past assemblies, I knew that Tiny was a very good dancer, and the girl could hold her own with anyone on the floor. But this was the first time I'd ever seen them dance together. She had on a bright blue dress that went down just below her knees, and he wore a dark suit with one of those real skinny ties. The two of them started in motion with the first note. One of his first moves was to jump in the air and land in a split. The performance got even better from there. It was really something to watch. Within 30 seconds, it was obvious that as good as they were by themselves, they were even better together. Tiny had moves that would make Michael Jackson look clumsy. A minute into the song, the audience was clapping and singing along. At some point during that dance... Racism didn't seem to have meaning. Andrew Mitchell, class of 1965. The issue of race could not be soothed so easily. Tension simmered before this particular assembly. The link between Oakland Tech and the Black Panther Party is strong. Huey P. Newton, class of 59, was one of its founders with Bobby Seale. Gregory Harrison was one of its early members and also a founder of the Black Student Union at Tech. He would have graduated in 1969, but for his expulsion by the state superintendent. My brothers went to school with all, all the different Black Panthers. Uh, most people don't realize that the uh, Black Panthers really started out in, as, as the neighborhood youth corps on, uh, on 55th and, and Market Street. Uh, right behind Santa Fe Elementary School, uh, Bobby Seals and, and a group of and a group of them had these had us young people in the summertime going at home to home cleaning yards, cleaning you know we were cleanup people. We were we did errands and things for people. That was what we were doing, and and and, and the state was taking care of all of this. You know, after that first year, they decided not to do it anymore. Well, these guys didn't want to get rid of these kids that they were trying to help. So uh, because of that and other things that were happening, they decided to start the Black Panthers. Um, my, uh, my, my parents didn't want me to be in the Black Panthers. They were worried about what was going on because they, a lot of things were being radical, radical and was going on. Uh, our, my great friend, Bob, uh, um, Bobby Hutton, Bobby Hutton, uh, I remember that at our senior picnic, he, he kept saying, man, you got to get in this group. I mean, we did it for us, we got to get in it. And I was, I was very unhappy that my folks wouldn't let me in it. But I, I, looking back on it, I'm very glad I didn't get into it. In fact, one of the first people that were killed was Bobby Hutton, my good friend. Uh, and I still, I still remember that. Despite a beautiful moment when a black dancer and a white dancer made people forget about racism, racial tensions continued to simmer and boil over throughout the 1960s the day after Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated in April 1968, a melee occurred at Tech. Fourteen students were injured, garbage cans were thrown out windows, and fire alarms were set off. Eventually, Oakland schools were dismissed. Another riot was sparked when 15 students were arrested off campus at hangouts near the school. Once again, desks were thrown out windows, Students were injured, and a beloved teacher, Mr. Katita, was severely beaten. His injuries, which required facial surgery, kept him out of school for eight weeks. He was offered the chance to transfer to another school, yet he elected to remain at Tech, which may explain why he was so beloved. There were some really great teachers here at Tech. During my time, one teacher in particular, his name was Peter Katita. C-U-T-T-I-T-T-A. He was a biology teacher. And uh, I'll never forget having him have me come up in front of the classroom and taught me the different aspects of the microscope by using direction and hand uh, direction so that I could feel what the different uh, aspects of the telescope, uh, not telescope, microscope was. Mr. Katita also would take time out of teaching biology and tell us about 
living your lives as productive as you're able to do. In other words, always put more than eight hours a day on the job. Always give more to yourself and try to understand the perspective of your, your friends and neighbors, where they're coming from. And he was a, a, a very dynamic individual and he used to kind of talk at us and yell at us in the classroom, but he wanted us to move off his center and be human beings that were making a contribution to, to society. And I think he did a very good job of it. The country was also embroiled in the Vietnam War. Tech students both enlisted and were drafted. Most of them returned, but not all. At least four tech students perished in the war. Warren won a scholarship to the California College of Arts and Crafts, but it was only a partial scholarship and to get a draft deferment, he needed to be in school full time. Since he couldn't afford to go right away and was draftable, he joined the Marine Corps and was sent to Vietnam. The incident Warren was killed in on July 2nd, 1968, was called the July 2 Offensive. More Marines died in that one day than any other single day of the entire Vietnam War. He was shot in the chest and died instantly. His body was recovered and sent back to Oakland. We had a funeral with full military honors at Evergreen Cemetery in East Oakland. He was 21 when he died. Daryl Grant, class of 1965. The racial tumult and the dissension over the Vietnam War encouraged students to establish clubs and groups that empowered them. Although the headlines included themes of strife and anger, the recollections of many alumni from the 1960s were of warmth for their classmates and appreciation of their teachers. Tech's drama program continued to flourish under the leadership of Tom Wayne in a brand new auditorium opened in 1962, and it changed lives and launched careers. Another student who fondly remembers Mr. Wayne is renowned children's book author Patricia Polotko. She graduated from Tech in 1962. Mr. Wayne's masterpiece is a tribute to the teacher who encouraged her to overcome her fear of public speaking and see herself as a masterpiece. Given the strength of the music and theater programs, it is fitting that the class of 61 undertook the renovation of the Steinway piano for their reunion gift. We were heartened to see how many people embraced this project. Many contributions came with notes honoring their music teacher from some class, in memory of a departed loved one, in honor of the school, etc. We were also able to add a piano bench. We were proud of what we were able to do for our school. Patricia Polacco, class of 1962. Gratitude is what inspires giving nearly 50 years later. I'm sitting here thinking of how my whole life would have been different if I had attended another high school. At Tech, I met my two best friends, Rose Mercy Quillalang, Yasa, and Sandra Shinomoto. Rose Mercy and her husband introduced me to my future husband. I was married to the same man, loving, wonderful, and intelligent, for almost 50 years. My husband and I were of mixed marriage. It was quite disturbing to some. I am an average student, but was enrolled in both business and college preparatory classes. I especially enjoyed my classes with Alice Perry, a typing teacher. Through her, I used my skill to secure a job and retire from the city of Oakland. Carmelita Ferrars Rickman, class of 1962. Not only are we talking about a racially mixed, we're talking culture. That there was culture um, that was just very different and so we all start dating each other and so you, now you're getting these cross mix of cultures that um, was very significant for the time especially with the Black Panther movement going on right in the middle of all of that tech we broke all the rules we always did you know we always marched at our own beat and always just came together um, as a group, when I think back about that, we didn't have that racial disparity among ourselves during that time. We just all came together and, and loved on each other, supported our school, 
and supported one another. It was very, very unique um, in that. And I guess it was just the time and the location that made it happen. Where other schools was either predominantly this, that, or the other, we kind of melted together. Entering the 1970s, the national call for social change continued, and nowhere was the call louder or prouder than in Oakland. Social activism and protests increased as the Vietnam War continued to claim thousands of American lives. Minorities and women were gaining a new voice as students across the country fought for equality and empowerment. Oakland Tech journalism students felt a sense of responsibility to be directly involved in these changes. A newspaper is ideally a publication which is not only entertaining, but thought-provoking and change-provoking as well. If, through the recognition of facts, we can't reweigh and reflect on our thoughts, then we are as stagnant as a clogged john. Dean Schenk, Scribe News Editor, 1970. As Oakland changed with the times, so too did Oakland Tech. At the start of the decade, social and demographic shifts in Oakland were also reflected at Tech, as many prospective students chose instead to attend Skyline High or private schools or move with their families to the suburbs. Oakland Tech was touched by tragedy during the decades with incidents of violence, one student, Rita King, lost her life at the hands of another in 1973. And yet, through these challenging times, Oakland Tech students and staff persevered and remained steadfast in their commitment to public education. Tech stayed true to its values of challenging its students academically, developing its students socially, and preparing students for college or the workforce. One of the many dedicated teachers of the 1970s was Mary Perry Smith. She championed the 60s call for change with passion and with amazing results. A beloved math teacher who believed that to be successful, she had to demonstrate to students why they had to take her class. Mary co-founded the Mathematics, Engineering, Science, and Achievement Program, MESA which encourages students of color to study and enter fields in math and science. She worked with professors at UC Berkeley to pilot and run MESA at Tech. The program became so successful locally that it is now available nationwide and open to all students regardless of race, ethnicity, or background. Mary was eventually hired away from Tech to train in the MESA programs full-time. Athletics at Tech also continued to thrive. By the mid-1970s, dozens of students who had honed their craft on the field and courts of Oakland Tech had gone on to achieve the ultimate in their sports by playing professionally. In baseball's Major League, the National Football League, in the National Basketball Association, and the Women's National Basketball Association. In fact, no fewer than 20 Oakland Tech baseball players have reached the major leagues, the second highest count of any high school in America. Over the 100-year history of Oakland Tech High School, um, the neighborhoods, the playgrounds, and uh, ball fields in North Oakland produce an amazing number of athletes. Uh, in fact, only one other high school in America has produced more Major League uh, Baseball players than Oakland Tech's 22 players. Um, Tech alumni include five Hall of Famers in baseball, basketball, and football, and several athletes who uh, created milestones in the world of sports. For example, um, two-time collegiate basketball All-American Don Lofgren brought us the modern-day version of the jump shot. He was the first to use it in about 1947. Um, and Brick Muller was the first collegiate All-American west of the Missis Mississippi River. And uh, Kurt Flood, who was a premier outfielder with the St. Louis Cardinals 
but is probably better known as the player who sued Major League Baseball and its reserve clause. Um, you may remember that the reserve clause back in the day really restricted players' movements, what team they could play for, and in salary negotiations. So Kurt's suit, which went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, really paved the way for the eventual free agency victory uh, for players in all sports. And it really changed the world of sports forever. Uh, so many, many athletes uh, from Oakland Tech High over the years um, created milestones and records in the world of sports. And the legacy continues today with uh, Marshawn Lynch, Super Bowl running back for the Seattle Seahawks, um, who is one of the premier running backs in the National Football League today. But none of the Tech High student athletes that preceded or followed him did it all quite like one ultra-cool member of the class of 1976. Ricky Henderson graduated from Tech having earned his block T in four different sports, but he truly excelled in football and baseball. On the gridiron, he twice rushed for more than 1,000 yards in a season, was a high school All-American, and earned multiple college football scholarship offers. But fortunately for fans of the national pastime, Ricky decided to devote himself to baseball and first appeared in the major leagues in 1979 with his hometown Oakland Athletics. And the athletes were outstanding. We had many who attended this school even before me, such as Kurt Flood, uh, many baseball players, but one in particular was on the baseball team and I was fortunate to have him there, and that was Ricky Henderson, Hall of Famer, class of 76. Outstanding athlete, good kid, and a credit to Oakland Tech and to Oakland, and maybe baseball. After 25 years in the major leagues, playing for nine different teams across four different decades, winning two World Series titles along the way, the all-time major league career leader in stolen bases, run scored, and leadoff home runs was voted into baseball's Hall of Fame on his first ballot in 2009, the same year that Tech High's new baseball field on 45th Street was named in his honor. Ricky is routinely considered to be one of the top 50 baseball players of all time, and in a recent ESPN ranking, was selected the 14th best player in the history of the game. Self-described high school misfit Rod McEwen didn't actually graduate with his class in 1951 because he had to earn a living, and he felt it was time to move on. McEwen left Oakland and spent time performing odd jobs up and down the California coast before settling in San Francisco and breaking through as a folk singer and beat poet. He would go on to become an award-winning songwriter, composer, singer, and poet, penning more than 1,500 songs, songs performed over the years by the likes of Barbara Streisand, Perry Como, Johnny Cash, Madonna, Dolly Parton, and Frank Sinatra. He received two Academy Award nominations, composing the score for both The Prime of Miss Jean Brody and A Boy Named Charlie Brown. In 1974, the Grammy Award winner was invited back to Tech to receive his honorary diploma and the assembly at which he spoke served to illustrate how bulldog respect spans the generations. Having not been in Oakland for more than 20 years, I had no idea of how drastically Oakland Tech High had changed since I was last in the city. The student body was now nearly 100% black, and they didn't have a clue as to who the hell Rod McEwen was. Never mind being receptive to a white guy's songs in a form of entertainment. Without a doubt, I was about to face the toughest audience of my life. What in the world could I possibly do to entertain these pubescent youngsters with a culture worlds away from mine and who had probably only come to the assembly as a means of cutting class? At least, that was always my motive for attending assembly when I was a student. But I won them over. How? Well, I turned the hour and a half into a question and answer period where the Q's and A's had very little to do with me. We discussed everything from showbiz to sex, 
and along the way I sang a song or two and coaxed some of the more adventurous students, and it turns out quite talented ones, onto the stage to do their thing. It was an anxious moment, but I had a ball. In the end, I got a standing ovation. Rod McEwen, class of 1951 and 1974. We owe our state's celebration of Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday in part to a teacher and small group of Oakland Tech students from the class of 81. They called themselves the Apollos after the Apollo 13 space mission. And with their sponsor, social studies teacher Tay MacArthur, they began lobbying Sacramento lawmakers until the California legislature declared Martin Luther King's birthday a state holiday more than a year before the federal government did. In 1977, uh, a new class of students came to Oakland Tech, and this, these were the first ninth graders that we had had uh, at Oakland Tech since the 1930s. I was a member of the political action committee there at Oakland Tech and also class treasurer at the time. In the course of, uh, of the fall of 1979, uh, I brought to their attention that the Martin Luther King holiday in Congress had failed one more time and it had failed every single year and it died in committee. It never ever got to the floor of Congress. I remember it was in our U.S. history class, uh, the question came up as to why there was no holidays for an African American or anyone of color. And they said, well, they ought to have it. And I said, I would agree. And they said, what would it take to do it? And so we sought out to do it from that point. And they were eager, straining at the leash and very excited about it. And I said, uh, this is not an easy chore. And I said, you got a choice. You want a nice show with a lot of marching and, and demanding, or do you want it to become law? They said, well, we want it to become law. And I said, it'll take a year to prepare for this. We were getting up early in the morning to be in Sacramento for 7 o'clock. So um, that was on our own time. Even on the weekends, we were going out and trying to um, solicit support from different community um, people. And it was a very sophisticated campaign. One Republican, also from Orange County, told us, he said, uh, you need 21 votes to have it pass. He said, I'm supportive of it, but I'm not going to support it and have it fail. You get 20, 20 votes on the floor, and I'll give you your 21st vote. And that's exactly what he did. The place exploded in applause, tears and hugs. and It was, it was really mellow. Yeah, we were very, very happy and excited that we had something to do with it know that we had a voice. The federal government followed suit by approving Martin Luther King Jr. holiday in 1983, and the first national holiday honoring Dr. King took place on January 20th, 1986. Even after helping make it a holiday in California, Oakland Tech's Martin Luther King Committee continued to lobby states that hadn't yet adopted Dr. King's Day of Recognition. Unlike sister schools Oakland High and Castlemont, which were also architectural gems among Oakland's public schools, the magnificent exterior of Oakland Technical's main building has remained largely unchanged for 100 years, surviving earthquakes, fires, and renovations. One of those renovations had begun in 1977 when Oakland Tech moved lock, stock, and barrel to its new temporary home on Grove Street between 58th and 59th Street, formerly the site of University High School and Oakland City College. As the result of a two-year delay in the start of the project, however, students in the class of 1981, 82, and 83 spent the entirety of their four-year Oakland Tech careers at the Grove Street location. During this period, enrollment at the school dropped from 1,500 students to 900, despite adding the ninth grade class to the school in 1977. Despite the return to the Broadway Tech in 1983, 12 seniors in Mr. MacArthur's honors American government class decided to seek landmark status for Oakland Tech. 
Thanks primarily to their efforts, the architectural masterpiece designed by J.J. Donovan was eventually designated an historical landmark in 1985 by the Oakland City Council. A monument now stands in Landmark Plaza at the front of the school, commemorating the efforts of those students responsible for it becoming an historical landmark in Oakland. When we, with practiced eye, preserve a shining example by the hands and from the hearts of an era past, we create additional luster in the lives of the yet unborn. 1985 Student Historical Landmark Committee, Tay MacArthur. Well, I remember um, being proud of this school. It was big and impressive looking. And when I pass here, and just the physical presence of this place, uh, you know, I'm sure I tell everybody, I brought my kids back here. This is where I went to school, you know, just its presence. I, I remember reading that Casamon used to actually have a castle. You don't really see that when you go up there now. So like to see Tech, you see this huge building and you're like, I need to see pictures. Yeah. You see 1950, you're like, oh, it's pretty much exactly the same. So that, that really lets you know the history of this school. We used to say that, you know, Tech out front looked like the White House. You know, we had that, oh yeah. Y'all go to that White House looking school. Uh, so we were kind of known for that. The same sense of social responsibility, civic and school pride, and passion for learning led Oakland Tech staff and students to create several new academic programs in the 1980s, including the Health Academy, the Engineering Academy, and the Paideia Program. Paideia was launched in 1986 with the support of then Oakland Tech principal Dennis Chaconis, who had asked teachers Marietta Joe and Marianne Wolf to build a challenging humanities curriculum for the school. At the time, students wanted a more rigorous program, and staff wanted to better prepare tech students for admission to the best universities in the nation. For the past 29 years, Ms. Joe and Ms. Wolf had worked to ensure the continued success of the program, and the proof is in the pudding. Paideia students' scores in AP English, Government, and History are far above the state and national averages. Students educated in Paideia and other academies matriculate to and graduate from the best universities across the land, but remain bulldogs for life. Among my kaleidoscope of memories are those of Miss Wolf and Miss Joe's classrooms in the Paideia program, dance club with Ms. Van Duke, the pre-engineering drafting tables, Principal Chaconis striding the hallways, lunch on the back steps, after school dances in the basement cafeteria, being welcomed to play on the boys' soccer team, and dissecting a fetal pig in the science lab on the second floor. My time at Tech remains a touchstone for my life, one I hearken back to even now as a physician a scientist, educator, wife, and mother. I am thankful its legacy continues. Veronica Yank, class of 1989. Due to a glitch in his class schedule, Omar Shabazz ended up with both physical education and dance one year at Tech. His dance teacher, Laura Manduke, asked him to perform with the dance club she ran. The day he tried out for the club, the director of the Oakland Ballet happened to be there. Upon seeing Omar dance, he told him that he was good enough to have a career in ballet. And that is exactly what happened. Within six weeks, Omar was on stage performing with a professional dance company. He has been a professional dancer and dance instructor ever since and is currently on the faculty of the Oakland Ballet School. Despite declining enrollment, incidents of violence, budget shortfalls, and district cutbacks, Oakland Tech continued to receive accolades for its innovative academic programs in the 1990s. Secretary of Education Richard Riley spoke at graduation in 1995 to recognize Oakland Tech for its health and engineering academies. 
1998, Oakland Tech was featured in the PBS documentary Surviving the Bottom Line as a school that was succeeding in part due to its focus on career academies. Employing the school within a school model, academies at Tech are centered around a specific discipline or vocation, allowing students to specialize in certain academic subjects. So I joined the Health Academy in 10th grade. I actually took what I learned from the Health Academy into my undergrad uh, college career because I studied public health in undergrad. And what I learned from the internships in my Health Academy classes trans helped me transition into my public health classes at Fresno State. And so I did internships there. I did internships in college. And I was I will say I was very prepared for um, my undergrad when I joined a um, public health degree. Today, Oakland Tech offers academy programs in many different subject areas, which, even 100 years later, perpetuates the vocational and intellectual model of education introduced by Principal Fisher in 1915. Oakland Tech's knack for producing talented actors and entertainers also continued into the 90s. Rockman Dunbar, class of 1991, has dozens of movie and television credits to his name, including recent appearances on television series such as The Mentalist, Sons of Anarchy, and The Practice. Mahal Montoya, class of 1992, has appeared in numerous commercials, television series, and films, including the recently released The Diary of a Teenage Girl. Mahal is also a practicing attorney with her own law practice in Oakland. Anita Morgan Woodley, class of 1994, is an award-winning journalist and writer and has created and performed several one-woman plays, including Mama Jugs, which honors her mother and great-grandmother, and The Men in Me, which centers on the men in her family. As Oakland Tech moved into the 21st century, its legacy of excellence was reignited reinforced and augmented. Opportunities increased for students to distinguish themselves in academics, athletics, vocations, and the arts, and served as a further illustration of the commitment, diversity, and passion which still thrives at Tech. Students in Oakland Tech's Engineering Academy are frequent recipients of awards from local science competitions each year, and the Academy hosts its own annual bridge-building contest. The student who built the bridge that can support the most weight is declared the winner. But it is the sight of their hard work exploding under the weight of a bucket of sand that seems to be the highlight of the competition each year. Many of these academic and extracurricular programs would never have flourished as they have without the support of hundreds of Oakland Tech parents. Participation by Tech parents in school activities and fundraisers has increased significantly over the last decade and illustrates the renewed commitment to the school by all members of the Oakland Tech community. In 2006, a dedicated group led by Oakland Tech parents, coaches, and Principal Sheila Anduhar received approval to use the property at the recently decommissioned Carter Middle School on 45th Street, formerly Woodrow Wilson Junior High School, seizing the opportunity to create a new Oakland Tech baseball field closer than Bushrod Park. The groups of parents plus dedicated alumni, staff, students, coaches, and business and community leaders designed, coordinated, funded, and built the beautiful baseball facility that has been dubbed the Oakland Field of Dreams. Now officially called Ricky Henderson Field, 
The facility is still maintained almost exclusively by Oakland Tech parents and volunteers and serves not only Oakland Tech, but all of Oakland youth baseball. It is now the crown jewel of fields among Oakland's public schools, and not coincidentally, the baseball Bulldogs have won six consecutive Oakland Athletic League championships. Dozens of drama and musical performances each year are presented in Tech's beautifully refurbished auditorium. The renovation of the auditorium has been a parent-driven project lasting more than 10 years. For the three-phase renovation, parents have raised nearly $1 million for improvements to lighting, acoustics, stage flooring, seating, curtains, and a sound and lighting booth. So I'm Miss J. I'm the drama teacher here at Tech, and this is my third year here, and I was part of bringing back the performing arts to Tech, which was an idea that the parents had about three years ago to really revitalize the arts. This is a really wonderful place to go to. The performing arts kind of become these small learning communities, and really we're becoming known as a really model program for the performing arts in the district, and that's something I'm really proud of at a large comprehensive high school. The news is we have amazing students and student talent. The bad news is we had an auditorium that suffered years of neglect, torn curtains, broken seats, no sound system. So parents and principal, we started putting together a plan. It's in three phases to totally revamp the auditorium into a state-of-the-art facility. These are but a few of the thousands of graduates of Oakland Technical High School who have achieved and contributed in extraordinary ways after graduation. But why and how has this public urban high school, which is not unlike thousands of other high schools across the country, why has Oakland Technical seemed to produce so many incredible difference makers, alumni who have achieved so much in so many different fields, and at such extraordinary levels. Perhaps it has been the education ideals with which Principal Fisher opened the school in 1915. The philosophy of intellect and hard work, of inclusion and innovation, of creating opportunity for and a sense of responsibility in every student who ever enrolled at Oakland Technical. Or perhaps it has been the history and culture of Oakland, of the working class neighborhoods and values from which students came that has shaped and driven them to succeed in extraordinary ways. Most certainly it has included the commitment and passion of 100 years of faculty and staff who dedicated their lives to public service through educating generations of Oakland teenagers. In any case, for 100 years, Oakland Tech graduates have scattered to the four corners of the globe to make their mark, to make a difference, and in so doing, they represent what it means to be an Oakland Tech bulldog. And you are one of them. The graduates and staff highlighted in this video may have performed on a more prominent stage locally, nationally, or internationally. But behind that ornate facade at 4351 Broadway, up and down the hallways, in the classrooms, on the fields, and the front lawn, we were all just Oakland Tech Bulldogs. As alumni, we have and will always have a special connection to all who have walked through those bronze front doors before us and to those who who passed through them long after us. We now honor a century of Oakland Technical High School, 100 years of tech high staff, teachers, principals, administrators, coaches, custodians, security guards, cafeteria workers, and 100 years of tech nights. More than 30,000 of us. We can all take pride in being an Oakland Tech Bulldog, we have a lot to be proud of. We are the Bulldogs, the mighty, mighty Bulldogs. 
Everywhere we go, people want to know who we are. So we tell them we are the Bulldogs. And that says it all. That says the pride that we, everywhere we go, people want to know. Why? Because we're special. We stand out no matter where we go. And so we're pride to say, I'm, a, I'm from Tech. I went to Oakland Tech, the purple and gold and Bulldogs. And that's who I am and what I am. I'm very proud of Tech. And I still, you know, when we drive by Tech, I always look at it's it. It's a beautiful school, and, yeah. and think, oh, it's so pretty, it's beautiful. And now the scholastically it's doing so well, that is, makes even more proud. It's great. Well, in all humility, I was, I'm proud to be a part of this school. It, 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 it is a fantastic school, like I mentioned. The student population, outstanding. And, and of course, the faculty is super outstanding. I could mention a lot of names, but then I'd be at risk for neglecting a few. Uh, the outstanding faculty, and, and I think the school has made a contribution to Oakland, North Oakland, Oakland, and the state of California. And I'm proud to be part of it, and uh, hopefully it'll continue in the future, producing good students and good uh, contributors to society, good citizens. I'm sure it will. You're from tech, like, to graduate from tech, it, 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 it's cocky to say, but it says a lot. Like, to be an Oakland Technical High School graduate, it's saying that I went to the best school, I am one of the best, I made it through as the best. Go Bulldogs!